Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a great pleasure to have you here for the third of the Design History Society events in collaboration with this wonderful Four Art History Festival. Many of you may have joined Nina Ramirez's digital talk. I had one on remembering things. And then the culmination of our project is this conversation today. Uh, many of you may know the Society, but I should introduce myself as well as my colleagues. My name is Claire O'Mahony. I'm chair of the Design History Society and an editor of our journal, the Journal of Design History. Now, this festival came out of a set of wonderful conversations with Greg, the CEO of Four Art History. And we thought it would be nice to try and suggest there are really wonderful synergies between the worlds of creative practice curatorship and historical research. And that's really the focal point of a lot of our conversation today. But precisely through the human element of a wonderful career that has combined all of those different ways of thinking about the world of things and places. Now, before I introduce our star player, <laughs> I'll also mention our interlocutor, um, Cher Potter, who has been a research fellow at the VNA and also taught um, in the uh, Creative Arts University in London. I'm quite proud as well that she is a student from the program in the history of design that I run at Oxford and was the uh, prize winner of the Postgraduate Essay Award this year. So we've got nice design history connections there. But what I thought we'd start off with, rather than me sort of citing the things that make me enthusiastic about the fact that we secured your presence here today, Christine. Uh, a pleasure to think that this is a career that spans the world of textile design, fashion design, that creative practice, alongside curatorship within institutions in the United Kingdom, but also in Johannesburg, but also this whole world of research that intersects that world of practice and public dialogue through objects. So that's the sort of coming attractions of who we're going to hear about. Now, I secured myself as chair the pleasure of the first question, but we will then have three questions from chair, and then we will open up to the room the opportunity for you to ask questions of Christine Chesinkta. So my first question to you, Christine, is might you be willing to talk us through how you feel this wonderful intersection between your creative practice, your curation, and the world of historical research intersect? Thanks so much, Claire, and thank you for inviting me to take part and to contribute to these conversations. Thank you all for coming. Um, I think the first thing I want to say is that it has been quite a long career. So, I mean, I, I left art school almost 35 years ago. And I think I was of that generation where going to art school, yes, you had your specialist area, and mine was fashion and textile design. But it was also about creativity. And I think I left art school with this idea that um, that creative spark could be applied to many things over and above fashion and textiles. And I think that that's, that teaching is something that has stayed with me. Um, and often when I'm asked about uh, my career, because it does span design, installation art, spoken word, teaching, now curating, I think for me what I'm drawn to is the object mm -hmm. and the theatre of fashion, the way mm -hmm. that fashion can speak, the way that objects can speak. Um, you know, and that lovely um, question, I think it's Daniel Miller, um, says at the start of his book, Stuff, do things make us as much as we make mm -hmm. things? And I think that that's what's really drawn me. And through my career, I found that there are particular niggles or inklings <laughs> that I want to explore through design or I want mm -hmm. to explore through writing or I want to explore through speaking. And I almost see these different components. Yes, they do all intersect. And I think the common thread is textiles is cloth but I think that I I'm just drawn to the object and I respond in a way that feels appropriate thinking about the object thinking about the issue 
um, I'm hoping that that sort of starts to answer your question. So there's a lot of sort of following my nose a little bit, but I see all of these practices as almost different tones of one creative voice. If you think about how we all speak, you know, you can, mm. you can whisper or you can shout or you can sing, but it's still you. And so I think that my creativity is rather like different tones of one voice. A beautiful response. Thank you, Christine. Pleasure. Yeah, great. Thank you. Right, I guess uh, continuing on from that, really, you speak about how you have ways of kind of um, developing different expressions for objects and activating objects through different kinds of um, kind of creative approaches. And we're really interested in talking to you about your the way that you've done that in relation to um, archives and collections. Mm -hmm. And um, so perhaps going all the way back to your PhD. Um, which you completed in 2019, I mean 2009, yeah. um, which is called Colonizing in Reverse, um, where you kind of, you speak about how you were unraveling a certain Britishness in um, uh, the kind of uh, um, people arriving on SS Windrush in 1948. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your, the photographic archives that you interpreted and also um, um, this idea of kind of looking through thrift shops and, um, yes. Uh, flea markets to find associated garments that link to the event and kind of evidence the event in some way. That's right. Um, all right, wonderful. We're on to the <laughs> wonderful Van Lee Burke image. So I chose the Van Lee Burke image, the boy with the bicycle, because my PhD is the last thing that you see. It's literally on the last mm. page, but also I think it's a window into this world of um, the Caribbean, the African Caribbean mm. presence and the objects that speak to that. Um, and so I was always mesmerized by those iconic images, now iconic images, of the Windrush passengers mm. descending gangplanks in these wonderful mm. suits. And of course, with Windrush, the first ship, it was primarily men. Mm. And that kind of combined with a moment in my career where I was known as an English look designer or a British look designer, and yet I somehow wasn't sure about my own place with that. So there were lots of questions and contradictions. So the objects were already there. I was fascinated by the idea of the suit and the grey suit. And the, that sort of idea of invisibility and yet the you know, invisibility of the individual. But what fascinates me about men's suits, for example, is the subtle differences that can speak volumes, whether it's the width of a lapel or the cut of a trouser. You know, I always remember my father saying that you could always tell you could always notice a Jamaican pair of trousers in the, in the 40s because they always had functional back pockets and they always had a wide leg rather mm -hmm. like a, a zoot suit pant. Mm -hmm. So that was already in the air. Um, and it's lovely this, that you've brought up the thrift shops because I remember um, doing my MA and this was the start of my entry into the world of PhDs mm -hmm. and doctorates and research. And I remember wanting to almost emulate those images, those mm. Getty images of the men arriving in Southampton and so on, the Tilbury docks. And I literally got in my car. I knew that the men, the first arrival, arrivals, if they didn't have a place to go, they stayed in the, I think it's a disu disused underground at Clapham, okay. Clapham Common. Mm. And they were sort of housed there and they were sort of fed and watered there before they you know, got jobs or other mm. places to go to. And so I literally jumped in my car and started mm. driving around all the thrift, thrift shops around Clapham Common looking for grey pinstripes of suits. But that became the starting point of the PhD research. Why did those men look that way? What do we mm. mean by Englishness in dress? What do we mean by Britishness in dress? So it started with that grey suit, mm. started with that thought, that image of my father in his grey suits, if you like. He had a wardrobe of grey suits. Being well dressed was very important to him. And often his suits were, well, they were always made in English wool. Yeah. Always. Um, and certainly a lot of the, the men, mainly Jamaicans that I interviewed for my PhD, they all wore wool suits. And that was really part of the look. But I wanted to understand why. And of course, that led me to looking at archives like those in the VMA, looking at prints and drawings, looking at photographs looking at private archives as well. So <coughs> these interviews yeah. with these African Caribbean elders were really key. And um, I would always start these interviews by saying to them, 
tell me about your life, but tell it to me through the clothes that you wore. And so often the men would come with you know, the hat that they wore on arrival, put back in its box, still with the feather, beautifully immaculate. And I remember there was one particular wonderful man that bought me a shirt that he wore. And again, it was neatly laundered and pressed and put back mm. into the cellophane in which it was bought. So this idea of the public archive yeah. versus the private archive was always something that interests me. And I'm always quite intrigued by um, what we collect as institutions, mm -hmm. but also what we save and we hang on to as individuals. What are the things that tell our stories? You know, we all have keepsakes, mm -hmm. I think. So what are those things that travel with you from one place to the next? Can you map your own life, if you like, through those textile-related yeah. objects? Which leads us really nicely onto the next question, actually, which is exactly about this issue of your kind of personal archives mm. versus addressing public archives and, yes. and also into the present, so to 2021, where you've worked on two really interesting projects. Um, the one, so I don't get this wrong, um, uh, conceived by the curator Grant Watson, was called Folded Life Talking Textile Politics. Yes. And uh, the other was um, an inaugural. Uh, exhibition for the Craft Gallery, uh, the Craft Council's new gallery. And um, the exhibition there was called Maker's Eye, Stories of Crafts. Mm. And I just wondered if you could talk us through this idea of, of, of textile politics, you know. Mm. Uh, so one, in the case of you um, kind of sharing your own personal um, um, archives um, for the Grant Watson project. And then secondly, this idea of addressing public archives and adding to public archives mm. in mm. the Craft Council project. So, um, yeah, if you could tell us a little bit more about this idea of, of textile politics and how that plays into both the personal and, and public archives mm. projects that you mm. worked on. Sure. I mean, Folded Life was a, a wonderful project to be involved in. And so this, was, um, this took place during lockdown, and mm. the curator Grant Watson approached, I think there were four of us in the end, all working mm. with textile archives, or textile artists. And... During the course of the conversation, um, I remember that I had a, a box of my mother's little odds and, odds and bits and pieces of lace you can see on the screen and the press studs and even a pair of her white gloves that she brought with her from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And they were just in a box that I hadn't opened um, since she passed away in, in 2009. Mm -hmm. um, but we discovered during the course of our conversation this wonderful relationship between notions of femininity and the work that I did, you can see the ruffle shirt on one side of the screen, is one of the designs that I created when I was principal designer at Laura Ashley. And there's this wonderful connection between the lacy Englishness of my mother's, you know, colonial, you know, because mm. she was a colonial lady being born mm. in the 30s, colonial associations with lace, white, yes. white cloth, white gloves, being pristine, being proper, and then me, sort of X number of years later, 30 years later, working for Laura Ashley, and sort of seeing that connection between my yeah. mother's story and my story. And I think this is the, this is the joy, really, of the personal archive, because these mm. sorts of things probably would not make yeah. their way into, um, you know, an institution like the V&A, but it's the stories that are attached to mm. them, and the, the potential stories that can be told around them that I find yeah. really fascinating. So in a way, thinking about the politics of textiles and fashion, I mean, when it comes to textiles, for example, Elan Atsui, the artist who I love, famously mm -hmm. said that cloth is to Africans what monuments are to Westerners. Mm -hmm. And I love that idea because it sort of demonstrates the power of these objects to somehow speak if we care to animate them, care to dig around and find the stories mm -hmm. around them. So I think that often fashion can be a way of pushing against society's boundaries mm. um, or what society might expect you to be like. And um, this is something I saw with my father in his suits. You know, a Jamaican man who worked in a foundry all his life, pretty much all his life, and yet was always very dapper. Mm. So it's a way of speaking, and I think that's the power of fashion and textiles. Yeah. Um, which brings us really um, to your forthcoming project, which is, um, I'm sure most of you know, but um, 
Christine is the curator of a um, large-scale exhibition at the V&A next year, mid next year, isn't it? Mm. Um, called Africa Fashion, yeah. and um, you've spoken a lot about this idea of um, the kind of meeting points between opposites in this conversation and past conversations that we've mm. had, and very nicely said something about you constantly in search for the moment of clash. Yes, yes. and um, I wondered if you could tell us a bit about trying to tackle the idea of Africa Fashion, which of course is um, enormous diversity and and um, and all sorts of kind of opposing and correlating ideas and mm. how you've kind of managed to to communicate that within within an exhibition sure. and how you've worked with VNA archives to do so. Um, well, let's move on to the next slide and then I think what I'll do is just speak briefly about yeah. this and maybe use this as a way of illustrating what I mean by clash. I think what really inspires me in, in pretty much all of my work are these moments of tension. Um, much of my work, particularly when mm. I'm thinking about Caribbean cultures, it's this idea of creolization coming out of the tension between yeah. the European and the African inspirations that come mm. together, but there's tension. It's not about blending, it's holding the mm. tension, but there's a spark within that mm. as the cultures, the multiple cultures brush and bump into each other. And for me, I always think that that's mm. where creativity lies, mm. in that moment of clash or in that moment of holding the tension. And I think that's often when I'm teaching, I'm looking for that, that little twist or that little yeah. kind of sparkle. You know, and if we're talking about cooking, it's, it's that little bit of chilli pepper in your, mm. <laughs> you know, your rice and peas, mm. you know, that mm. makes the thing sing. Um, and so this image is from The Maker's Eye, which is still on if people want to go to it. It closes on the 8th of October. Mm. But what I like about this, you can see two of the objects that I've selected. In the back, you have the wonderful um, textile piece by the artist Anya Paintsill, who is based in Manchester, but her heritage is Ghanaian and Welsh. And then you have the fabulously sensuous ceramic um, vessel by Mag Magdalena Dondu. But both artists are thinking about um, fashioning the feminine, if you like, or thinking mm. about gender, thinking about womanhood mm. and thinking about race, but done in quite different ways. And I, I like the kind of the opposite. So with Madeleine, you have this wonderfully subtle approach. And then with Anya, it's just much more out there. Mm. But I like this idea of the opposites coming together. And so maybe if we move on to the next slide. So working on Africa fashion, so the exhibition opens next June. And it is I think I've given the V&A a bit of a problem <laughs> <laughs> in some ways. A good problem to have because I knew that I wanted to really showcase the abundance of the mm. continent. I mm. know it's 54 countries and I want to show that idea mm. of mm. diversity and nuance and clash mm. because I think that that is what's creating that vitality that we see when we look at yeah. the African fashion scene now and in years previously and so that's that's really the story that we're trying to tell with this survey show we're saying that there are multiple ways of being african mm. there are multiple ways of being fashionable and african mm. and there's a joy in that but it's consciously celebrating that so we're holding the glamour and the politics together so the opposites mm. come together and i, I recognize in many of our conversations mm. prior to this one that that's also a common thread in my work this idea of the opposites but I think it comes out of my own kind of experience of being in diaspora of inhabiting multiple worlds but somehow mm. still being able to create and I think coming out of a Caribbean background with that creolized culture that's you know musically it's Jim Reeves on the one hand mm. and then it's you know, Brooke Benton, and then it's, you know, Bob Marley, whatever it is, mm. on the other, or Soka on the other. Mm. It's this coming together of seemingly opposite things, but creating a harmonious whole, doing something yeah. new, because you're holding that tension. So I think that that's what people will see within Africa fashion, this embracing of diversity. Mm. Yeah, we're really looking forward to that. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. It does, it does. I mean, I would love to hear more about how, um, 
um, you've worked with the V&E archives because yes. I would imagine that you you're also adding a lot to the V&E archives. We're adding a lot, and in fact, my role was in train um, way sort of many years before mm. I actually joined. So. I joined the museum in June last summer, but I was offered the post in January. Mm -hmm. And my original role, it wasn't to create this exhibition, my original role was to broaden the V&A's holdings oh. to include more um, objects that showcase African and African diaspora mm. excellence in terms mm. of fashion mm. and textile. So that was my original role. Mm. And then literally a few weeks before I joined, my, my now new boss said, well, actually, there's another project we'd like you to work <laughs> on too. Yeah. And the other project was the Africa Fashion Exhibition, which mm. was in train, um, but there was no concept yet. Mm. And so that's really what I've been working on for the last year. And what's been very exciting is being able to go into the textile archives at the V&A and pull out pieces of indigenous cloth, whether that's kente or adere, mm -hmm. commemorative cloths, uh, wax resist. A lot of it collected in the 1960s, mm -hmm. much of it never yeah. put out on display. And so I literally went into Blythe House before it closed and opened up the drawers and unraveled these beautiful textiles that we're now going to be able to show as part of this exhibition. And similarly going into our photographic ar mm -hmm. archives and finding beautiful imagery that perhaps has not been shown and certainly hasn't been shown in conjunction with these textiles. So it's been an absolute joy to be able to expand mm -hmm. our archives on the one hand, but to pull out the textiles to do little bits of new research into the textiles, to work with community experts, to try and mm. reanimate those pieces that we currently have, as well as broadening our holdings. And so I think that, for me, has been a real joy about the role so far. Yeah, it's so exciting that, honestly. I mean, you speak in previous um, um, essays that I've written of yours where you say that dress is a route to reconstructing fragmented histories. and. Yeah. It seems you're really doing that within the kind of within the institution. Absolutely, and I, yeah. I think that this kind of bits and the bits and pieces approach, mm. I think, is rooted in my heritage, but also as a designer. That's what you do to create a collection: is a little bit from here and yeah. a little bit from there, and you bring it together. And yeah. so I think that that approach is there within the Africa Fashion Exhibition. But it's a way of mapping these these. It's not missing histories; they're just hidden, and it's shining mm. a light on them, giving mm. a platform for the fashion creators on the continent primarily to speak and animating those textiles from our own mm. archives. So I, I always feel that none of my work is really about me, which is quite strange because I've shared about my parents in this talk, but Africa fashion, it's not about me, it's about giving a platform for mm. African creatives to showcase their work in the way that they want to be represented, in the way we want to be represented. Um, and I think that that's what people will pick up, or I hope that's what people will pick up. It's absolutely curated from the perspective of centering African excellence, African creativity, multiple African perspectives. I feel that that's what I'm there to do. Mm. Thank you so much. That's been an absolutely Pleasure. fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for your time. <coughs> Um, I'll pass back over to Claire. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure we've all been incredibly inspired mm. by this uh, extraordinary set of interventions around the ways in which historical experience is both proactively occurring now mm. as a sensorial activity, but also something which can be curated, can be uh, found in drawers, can be achieved mm. through these kinds of conversations. Mm. And I think part of what uh, we really are so honoured to have you speaking to us today as part of an energy within the disciplines of history of art, within design history, within historical studies more widely, to try and learn from that agility of multiple conversations, mm. to move away from concepts of national schools or international exponents and think of this sort of transnational conversation. I think we had a wonder, I had a wonderful sense of that today. I'm sure you all did too. But Cher and I have been incredibly greedy, holding to ourselves the chance <laughs> to ask you questions. And I think one of the really 
important things for me is also to share the potentialities of a life in the arts mm. that your experience show to us. Mm. I think we are living in a moment where precarity, where the emphasis on STEM subjects are really problematizing the place of culture. Uh, how wonderful to be once again having a conversation in person. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Isn't that magical? But I think there's also a sort of underlying tectonic shift that a lot of us across the fields of universities, museums, are really trying to remind ourselves culture is not something that only happens within the hallowed halls mm. of spaces like this. Mm. It defines who we are. It affects the soft power of diplomatic relations. It impacts upon our whole sense of activism and agency, whether that's around gender or class or identity politics. So I, I just want to celebrate the fact mm. that we have in our midst a demonstration of all of these potentialities as well as all the challenges of entering into those multiple spheres. So thank you for honoring us with sharing the voyage that brought you to that senior curatorship. But all of these other elements are so vital as well. Now I just wanted to open out to the audience the opportunity to ask questions of Christina. She's all right yes, with that. I did warn her. That we would do answer. that. Because we still have uh, about 15 minutes left to, to ask questions both about her career path, about this wonderful field of textile making and research, about the relationship of design writing and curatorship. There's so many wonderful things we've all wanted to explore. Uh, so I, I wanted to open it out to all of you to see if there were any questions you wanted to ask of Christine. Yes, <laughs> jump in. Uh, pass the mic along. Yes, of course, thank you. And don't be shy, it's a wonderful chance to, it's rare we get a chance to ask our heroes <laughs> questions in life. <laughs> Can you hear me? Is that working? Yeah, absolutely. Um, now that you're working for a large organization like the VNA, uh, and in the past, you were very much working on your own as a designer. Do you prefer working on your own and just drawing, or are the complications of other human beings that you have to deal with exciting as well? That's a great question. So the question was about the difference between working on my own and drawing versus working in a larger organisation. And I do. Ha I I love being at the v &A, and I love bringing all the strands of my experience together and funneling them into this role. But I have to share with everyone, between you and I, <laughs> I do have days where I have to hide in my little studio and draw, because I miss, I miss the, the physical act of drawing, and I miss the sound of the pencil on the paper, and I miss the fluidity of that. I miss going into that little bubble that you're in when you're just drawing. So I find that I still, even though I'm working on Africa fashion and I'm you know, expanding the collection and I'm working with other new Africa curators, for me, my creativity needs that moment of just sitting and drawing. So I still do it. So I still have sketchbooks, as I did when I was a student all those years ago in Bristol. I still have sketchbooks. I still have scrapbooks. I still draw. I still need to do it. It's a great question. Mm -hmm when something we were talking about in the galleries walking through that, that pausing and looking, mm. and spending an hour, half an hour with a, thing, mm. a single object or a single text, that slow reflection, which is something I think central to, to all of us. It is, so. it is. And I think, I think for me, drawing is rather like looking. So mm. yeah. it's a really special time to stop uh, and ponder when I draw, you know, um, mm. I do a lot of thinking. I'm drawing. Yeah. Mm. Think with the hand as well as the eye. Yeah. 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 Fabulous. Is there another one there, please? Hiya. Um, oh, well, sorry. Um, what kind of obstacles have you found in working on a project like this, especially with working with so many people? Is there any been, like, notable things that you've sort of been running up against a brick wall at, do you think? It's, it's interesting because I'm sure that there are problems along the way, but I, I, I suppose I don't really see them as problems. I see them as things that I have to drive around. 
Um, mm. But I, I do have a sense at the v &A that there is this, um, you do feel as though you're being swept along. There is this, this, this feeling, this desire to birth this exhibition. There is this desire for permanent, sustainable change in terms of our strategies around Africa. So you feel drawn and swept along by that. So when issues come, you work with your colleagues mm -hmm. to, to either work them through or drive around to achieve what needs to be achieved. Um, but all exhibitions are always collaborative. So whilst I'm leading this, you know, there's an army of people that have come together to create this exhibition. Um, so I think I've, I've got a 35 years in the fashion industry. I think it's sort of given me this determination and tenacity, mm -hmm. but in a kind of a gentle way. I think mm -hmm. I just keep going somehow. Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you very much. You mentioned so many artifacts were in the collection, 1960s, never been seen, never displayed. This is a real confirming theme in all museums. It's a real challenge. How do we break out of that? How do we open that up? How do we get more access to that? How do we get that out into the public arena so they're not hidden? I think it's a great question. I, th I think that um, on the one hand, it's, it's the part of the curator's role is to bring those objects out. One of the things that I'm quite intrigued by, um, many of these textiles were collected by the circulation department, mm -hmm. the old circulation department. And part of their remit literally was to share objects with national museums. and. Um, in the world of Christine, I'm not, I'm not speaking about the museum now, but in the world of Christine, I wonder whether there's a, a new version of that, mm -hmm. this idea of sharing and thinking in a more joined up way, nationally and internationally, to bring those objects out and share them with the public. I think that we're getting, we're all getting so much better at recognizing that expertise exists beyond the museum. It's not just in the museum. So it's, looking at different ways of sharing as well as thinking about where we actually share stories around these objects. But there's absolutely so much work to be done. But I think that there's something interesting about maybe re-looking at um, moments like the circulation department and what would that look like today if we were to do a similar thing. That's what I would personally love to see and it's something that's in the back of my mind, maybe after the exhibition opens, I can start to think about how we might do that. Because, yes, I mean, it, it's a strange moment to open a drawer when you see these wonderful textiles and to know that they've not been on display before. It's a mixture of sadness and regret in some ways, but then they just, they look as though you bought them yesterday. They're stunning, absolutely stunning. So I think it's something that we will have to think about as institutions, how we get these pieces out and animate them. Yeah. Well, a couple, there's one there, the lady in the third row, yeah? And then two down here, thank you. Hi, um, I'm quite surprised at the v &A's collection of African textiles. I actually only started in the 1960s. Um, were you surprised? And also, are you then collaborating with, say, the British Library that's collections older or any others to showcase all the variations or as much of it as you could? Mm, that's a great question. I should clarify. So that whilst the, some of the textiles I mentioned were collected in the 60s, they date much further back. Um, and so we have things from the turn of the last century, for example. We have examples of Brown Fleming, so one of the first um, textile merchants to start producing wax resist print for the African market with all of that troubled history. So it does go much further back, it's just that those pieces were collected during the 60s. Um, so we, are, we do work with other museums, whether that's Brighton Museum or the Horniman Museum. So there is this wonderful collegiate approach to certain aspects of the exhibition that you'll see. But um, 
my push really was, particularly after opening those doors in Blythe House, to try and showcase what we have um, as, a, as a way, as this gentleman said, as a way of beginning the process of bringing out those wonderful pieces that haven't been out before. Um, so I hope that that answers your question. Uh, I think looking forward, I'm only at the point now where I'm beginning to think about our future strategies around collecting textiles. Um, so it may be that uh, we go even further back because, of course, African textile histories didn't begin in the 1900s. So um, it's something to think about beyond the exhibition for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of your talk. Is it being recorded, by the way? Yay, fantastic. Um, thank you. I I'm Sandra Shakespeare of the Black British Museum Project. And when you talked around the textiles, immediately I just thought of the um, Board of Trade collection. So if anyone wants to know, the Board of Trade collection at the National Archives has hundreds of thousands of samples of African designs or designs that were produced for African markets that go back to the 1800s and before. So do get on the National Archives Board of Trade registers. So I just wanted to say that as well. Um, my question to you, Christine, was really around the role of women, particularly thinking from my own background. I'm, I'm um, of Caribbean ancestry as well, and the story of women who came over as um, dressmakers, actually machinists, and I wondered how much, if that was something you were really making a conscious decision to highlight in the collection, because so often the role of women as crafters and makers and designers is, is hidden and it's not there. So I just wondered your, your take on that, particularly the role of women in the, as makers and designers. So thank you so much. That's a great question because, of course, my own mother, she was an embroiderer. So she, my grandmother was a dress, local dressmaker. My mother did the embroideries on the dresses that she made. Um, and then, of course, coming to this country, that creativity somehow waned, um, like many of those women. So it is something that I have researched prior to joining the museum. It is something... I'm in conversations with various people about this area. So it's not something that I won't look at. It's just with the Africa F at Fashion Exhibition, it's kind of eating my time. Um, so it is something I'm aware of, and it's something that I will go back to. Um, it is, it's a wonderful, wonderful history that still needs to be explored further, absolutely. And I think, for me, I'm always really mindful. A lot of my, there's always a sort of oral histories component to my work, and I'm very mindful um, of the aging population of that era and to capture those stories while we can. I mean, I interviewed my own mother on precisely this topic. So it's something that is in the background now, but only because I'm working on the Africa Fashion Exhibition it's something that I will go back to, and it's sort of tricking, you know, trickling away in the background. So it's, I'm keeping the flame burning for that research. So thank you for that. Mm. Thank you. Mm. I think as well what you'll see in the exhibition is that it, the role of women within the African fashion scene, you'll see that as part of the story, but mm. specifically Caribbean, that's kind of another project. Right, um, thank you. I'm going to just um, introduce myself. I am also a PhD. I just completed my PhD in African literature, film, and history as well. I lecture in the, in, in the UK, but one thing that I realized was the lack of black academics in the curriculum. So where do we go from here regarding Africa film and literature and trying to get this into the curriculum as well, so that that way there's also that cross conversation with young children who can also understand this history um, compared to working in the US where there's a big um, connection between museums and corporations as well. The Museum of Modern Art, the museums uh, in Harlem would also make sure that this is also written into the curriculum so the students can go in at a younger level so that by the time they get to MA or PhD, um, um, they know that they can also study this um, as a profession as well. 
Um, I grew up in Nigeria, and that was one of the reasons why I had access to African literature. If I hadn't had that, there's no way I would have done the MA and the PhD in Francophone African literature and understand what you're also talking about here. The lack of understanding and research in the UK um, regarding um, African um, studies is completely dire, and um, we have a big problem as um, obviously, but I'm sure you're trying to address that. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I think that I think that things have moved and shifted, but I think that what we probably need is a more joined up approach because a lot of the people, the academics I know, there are sort of individual groups that have formed over the years, but I think maybe we're in this moment. I'm looking at, at Sandra, isn't it, because I, I, I know of your work. I, I think that what we need now is a more joined up approach. That's what I'd love to see in, in the future. Um, so it's, it's not left to individuals. You know, I, I'm associated with Goldsmiths and with, you know, Professor Joan Animado, for example, and the work that she has done for, for decades on um, bringing together sort of female, black female academics, teaching, you know, gathering. You know, she swept me up when I was at Goldsmiths um, and took me under her wing and sort of introduced me to Caribbean literature, but often it's the one person. But I think we're at the, in the moment now where there needs to be more joined up thinking. I think there are fabulous, and often it's women, fabulous <laughs> people like Lavinia at the Black Curriculum, and there are various people doing great work to make a change. And I went into teaching because I felt very strongly, rather like you, that in order for young people to be to feel empowered, they need to see, you know, people like me, people like you, people like you, others that have been through the system, so that you show them, you embody that idea of potential. Mm -hmm. But I do think, in terms of education, what we need is a more joined up approach, I think, rather than it being left to individuals in different institutions, or even beyond the institution. Many of the people that do this work aren't aligned to an institution. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you do it, but I feel that that's what's required to move into a new phase. Mm -hmm. um, I can see someone, thank you, I can see someone applauding. You know, I just, um, just yesterday at work, I was in a conversation with a colleague, one of the curators, and which we were thinking about um, research within fashion, but research from archives, and I mm -hmm. shared with her that when I first started this process of research, so this is probably maybe 15, between 15 and 20 years ago, I first started this research, and I remember ringing a large institution, and I finally got through to a curator, and I said to the person, I really want to look at um, enslavement and dress, I want to look at Caribbean-ness, I want to look at what do people wear in that era, because they must have had clothes, mm. right? This was my thinking 15 years ago. And the voice on the other end of the line laughed, the person laughed. The idea that someone could be doing a PhD and wanting to look at dress and enslavement was comical 15 years mm -hmm. ago. But it sure isn't comical now. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you, there's lots of work to be done. But I do think that in my time, things have shifted. I would like to mm -hmm. think that if someone rang the v &A and said, I want to research slavery and dress, nobody would laugh. You know, and we have organizations like the Fashion and Race Database based in the States, but they're doing fabulous work at, of gathering people's um, research so students have somewhere to go to find out about the field that they now want to go in. So I don't know whether I would say that the situation is completely dire anymore, but my, there's more work to mm -hmm. be done. And I think that that's what really prompted me to come out of industry and go into mm. the museum was because I felt, you know, I've, I've had this long career, I feel I've got something to give back, and I don't want a young person to ring a museum and have someone laugh mm. at what they want to do. You know, and I don't want a young person. When I graduated from Bristol, I remember being given a place at Central St. Martin's, St. Martin's it, as it was there then, to do a fashion MA. And I was too frightened to take that up. 
and I don't want a young, another young person of colour to feel that's not for me, I don't belong, I can't do it. That's why I've come out of industry, and that's why I teach, but it needs to be more joined up. And if I can follow up on that, that's not just a job for you three. That's a job for us, it's a job for all of us. Mm. And I think that's part of what we're really trying to work as a society, as a discipline, to try and not appropriate, you're the star today, you're the one who should speak, but what can we do to facilitate this conversation, to get that presence on our reading list? And if I may just put a little plug in, we've got a new section of the journal, which is new formats. So a journal which has always been known for its historical approach, very archival-based, very object-centered, but that it will provide an opportunity for a different kind of writing, mm. a different kind of research, to be in an Oxford University Press journal. And I think it's those conversations as well mm. that you're intimating. I think we all have to be part of that activism, if you will. Um, so uh, if I may, as chair, say, tell us how to help. <laughs> mm. That, and, and I think you will find eager open arms. Yes. And that's where we're so indebted uh, to Christine for having opened up this conversation today uh, with so many present. Now, I'm cognizant we've technically gone over our time. I'm happy to stay if you are. I don't think <laughs> the next group is coming in right away. I noticed there was one more question over here, if we could um, get to that. But then I think those of you who do have other obligations, we do understand. Um, but I'll let the lady have her question there. Mm, I'm happy to, happy to answer great. another question. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Um, this is a curatorial question in line of how to exhibit fabrics and textiles without losing the idea of touch. So I recently took a school class to a Shoni Bar exhibition in Salzburg, and they kept asking me if they could touch the, the fabrics. And I kept being like, no, you have to wait. And then the last room they could touch, and they loved it. So how do you overcome this obstacle when touch is such an important element to textiles and fabrics, and a lot of times you can't actually touch them? So, yeah. Mm. I mean, with many of our exhibitions, we do have touch samples um, there so that you can get a feeling of um, what the fabric is like. Um, and also, we, um, one of the things that we're exploring, so we're exploring the idea of touch samples, so literally swatches that you can handle and feel. And a lot of museums will have their handling collections as well that you can handle and feel. But also, um, how can you, through AV, for example, um, Show the show someone or help someone to understand how a fabric moves, because of course that's part of fashion is the performance of it, mm -hmm. and how fabrics and garments are in movement. So it, really, that's that's my only answer to that. It's it's the touch samples, it's the handling collections, things that can be done through the public program, like working with handling objects. That's really been our approach, and that's what we'll continue to but get to, to do. But it is quite hard. Um, the other thing that I'm really conscious of is particularly when it comes to um, fabrics from Africa. Often when you go to an exhibition, you'll see them just hanging. And it's very easy to forget that these fabrics are worn. Mm -hmm. you know, they're not meant to be hung. They're meant to be used. And so this is something that I'm very conscious of and present to. So. It's something I'm working with our conservation team on. Which of those fabrics can we actually wrap, for example? Can we use some of these historical pieces? This is quite interesting, because you're not really meant to do it. But we're thinking about <laughs> ways of how can you tie a gele using one of these historical fabrics? Can we do mm. it without damaging mm. the fabric? Because otherwise, you're removing the cloth from this idea of everyday use. And as you were saying, it's, it's, those, it's the everyday stories mm. that bring these fabrics and these garments to life. So we are present to this issue and we're trying to find ways of getting around it to make, to, to breathe life into these fabrics and garments really, to close that distance. There's another lady here. Thank you. 
And I don't think that sense is, surely that's what drew us to our discipline, is we love that embodied research. Absolutely, so, uh, absolutely. I just want to say thank you so much. This has been so insightful and also quite inspir inspirational. Um, super excited for the show, uh, or the exhibition next year. Um, I think one of the points you made just in terms of Africa fashion and you know the challenges that come with having to kind of curate something that speaks to say 54 countries from a continent and I'll just um, want to get more thoughts on your ideas and how you navigate that and maybe is there something in terms of the future maybe you see it as a series that maybe starts focusing mm -hmm. on different parts of Africa and then on the flip side um, uh, really excited in terms of how as individuals we can contribute and support the work you're doing so if there's any opportunities for volunteering uh, just putting it out there um, if you could let Thank us know. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Thank wonderful. you. Thank you so much. We, again, two fantastic questions. So we decided with this show to do a survey show. We do see it as the first. We hope, we, we do have an ambition to do more. And so we hope in the future to take a theme or a country or designer and drill more deeply. But with this first one, we wanted to tell the story of abundance. We also wanted to blur those outmoded art artificial boundaries, colonial boundaries between sub-Saharan and North, for example, mm. or even East mm. and West. So we've taken a corners of the continent approach to give a glimpse of the scene. All we can do is mm. a glimpse, because it's impossible you know, to do 54, 54 countries. But at the moment, we're probably around 90% complete in terms of our object list. And we have just over 20 countries represented across the two floors and across the different themes mm. that we have within the exhibition. So we've been, you know, it's been a constant desire because of this desire to show the abundance and of African mm. excellence mm. when it comes to creativity. So that's been our approach. There have been opportunities to contribute. So for example, at the moment, we've just recruited um, a community panel um, of more mature, more mature advisors, shall we say? So we had the youth, because you know we had a youth panel, and I kept saying, "Well, what about everybody else? What about people mm. like me? You know, what about the old folks? You know, the over fifty-five? So we we now have a community panel. So do look out for um, the recruitment drives that we do. You'll find them on social media. Um, some of you may know that we launched the project quite early in January with a public call out for mm. objects. So again, you can have a look at the website for more information about that. Because I do want it to feel like, you know, it's a people's exhibition really. So yes, we're looking at the work of designers on the continent, but the diaspora is there in terms of the wearers. So please look out for that. Um, in terms of volunteers, if, um, this is why I can't remember the email address. I think it's at Africa Fashion at vam.ac.uk. If you email that, um, there might be potential for, we currently have um, three volunteers in place, but there may well be more opportunities because we don't, we like the idea of um, having volunteers in, but it's to upskill them so they can then go and find other work. So I know that one of them is about to leave because he's found work elsewhere, which is wonderful. So that's the, the reason why we're doing it. So there are opportunities to come and contribute. And then obviously during the events programme, there'll be ways of contributing because we see this exhibition as the start. Mm. So whilst we have the, cut, the public call out that was launched in January, there'll be opportunities once the exhibition opens to come and contribute, whether that's contributing mm. objects, contributing stories, contributing skill, learning from us, because that's been a real joy actually mm. for me, you know, being part of the BA. The expertise is quite mm. astonishing. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's wonderful. So anything that we can do to allow others the anything I can do, this is a me <laughs> thing again, to allow opportunities for people to come and learn. And it's a mixture of paid posts and voluntary posts because we are a charity. I'd love it if I could pay everyone, but we can't. So it's a real mixture of things. So there are ways to come and contribute at many different levels. So please look at the website. Please email africafashion at vam.ac.uk um, and go from there. Great nice. questions, thank you. And a great thing to end on, I think. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.
true praise indeed so thank mm. you all so much for coming let me also throw out the opportunity there as a charity the design history society is very eager to fund initiatives alongside these major institutions so have an idea get in touch we'll do our best to support you in that so thank you all for coming that's great <laughs>